2014. And that's probably as much as I wanted to say. I could keep going, but you know, you might have some questions. Yes. I've been wondering all throughout um, because I work for Disability ACT yes. and we're a support organisation. Yes. I know there are NGOs who also offer yep. support. And I know there are people out in the community who would like to access support systems. Mm -hmm. um, are who aren't currently? Yes. Who aren't currently, yes. Yep. So are they going to be preferenced? Is there, going, is there any strategy for the people who are in support? Yes. Are they going to be put on the back burner? That is part of that phasing discussion that I was mentioning before. So, yes, yes. Oh, sorry. So the question was, um, what happens with people who are not currently receiving any government funded supports? And I'm sure you all know people like that. Um, I can only speak about the experience in the trial sites to date. So absolutely that's recognised there'll be a component of people in the ACT who will be able to access the scheme because I meet the access requirements who are not currently receiving any government funded supports. So they've been referred to in the other trial sites as new clients only because they're not currently receiving any government funded supports. Um, I don't know exactly what's going to happen in the ACT. They will be able to access the scheme. There's nothing that will prevent them from doing that. But exactly how and when they will be phased in here, I don't know. In the other trial sites, anybody who was currently receiving support from any government funded scheme, we could identify those people either directly or through their current providers. And so we were able to get in contact with them. But of course, the people we don't know, we don't know. And so if you know anybody like that, tell them to contact the agency after the 1st of July. Tell them to go to the website, do the My Access Checker. And if you just say to them, look, we don't know at the moment how new people are going to be brought in, but we should know that very soon. In the other trial sites, what they did was allow people who were new clients to contact um, the agency at any time. So provided they were in the trial site, they were living there, they met the access requirements, they could contact the agency at any time. Yeah. Yes. Um, I've got two questions. Yes. Um, uh, my first question is about is uh, other supports like the disability pension, mm -hmm. best start, mm -hmm. um, all of those kinds of supports? Yes. Will they be affected by NDIS? Okay, so the question was, will other forms of support like the disability support pension, Better Start and the HACWA funding? So I used to actually, I, I started the Better Start program. Don't hit me, um, but I, implement, I implemented that program. Um, so they're, they're two very different things. So I'll deal with the DSP first. I want you to hear this message once only. The DSP is not affected by the NDIS. And the reason is, the disability support pension is income support. It's a completely different category of support to support that people get under the NDIS. The NDIS is about disability supports to increase participation. It's not about paying for rent or food or any of normal expenses of daily living, which is what the DSP is for. Um, so, you know, anybody who's on a DSP, they need fear not. It won't be affected at all by them becoming a participant. That's a really important point. They can still access funding through the NDIS. Exactly as they do now. They, they will continue to get their DSP. Um, that is their income, yep. you know. The other one, HACWA and Better Start, so Helping Children with Autism and the Better Start programs, it was one of the programs identified as in scope so there's another bit of jargon for you, an in-scope disability program. All jurisdictions went through a process of identifying every funding stream that was disability support. And there's a long list for each jurisdiction. The ACT went through the same kind of process. The intention is eventually that all of those funding sources will roll into the NDIS but it's happening in a gradual way. So obviously you just can't unpick all of those <coughs> arrangements immediately. Um, some, uh, some of you will work for providers, for example, who are block grant funded. So in the other jurisdictions, it wasn't possible to just simply undo all of those arrangements for the 1st of July. Some people were contracted, for example, till end of June 2015. So you can't just say, sorry guys, we're ripping the money off you. So it's going to be a gradual thing. 
Um, in South Australia, which is probably the best example because they're dealing with children in that age group right now, as parents have had their planning conversation with the agency, they lose access to um, Better Start and helping children with autism, which makes sense because NDIS will provide the disability supports that that child will need. Yeah. What, the other question yes. I've got around, um, you know when you were talking about potentially the need for support increasing? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, so when there are situations that mean that the disability and ageing supports kind of meet, mm -hmm. is that distinguished? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I'm thinking of, say, someone with Down syndrome, for example. Down syndrome, yep. Where perhaps the incidence of Alzheimer's or something like that may increase. Oh, I see, yeah. Those supports related to the onset of our science, yes. is that distinguished separately from the disability? Probably or? not. I mean, that would be just another thread to that person's level of disability. So if they're already a participant in the scheme and they needed additional disability supports because of uh, early onset Alzheimer's or whatever, that could be part of their plan. Okay, so yeah. it's Yes, that's right. I mean, there is a distinction. I need to be a bit careful here because I'm not a doctor. Um, th there is a distinction between supports provided through the health system, mm -hmm. which are about medical complaints that need medical treatment, visit to doctors, hospital admissions, that kind of thing, which should rightly be paid for by the health system. But anything else which is about supporting that person to participate, to go to work, to be at home, to do the shopping, whatever, that's the NDIS's responsibility. So there is a rule called support for participants, which is worth looking at because you can understand there are a number of those interfaces where there needs to be some discussion in every jurisdiction about how that will actually operate. Um, yeah, very, you know, not necessarily black and white. But anything that, that had an impact on their level of disability, I'm sure, would be um, managed as part of their plan. Yeah. Um, so you had a question? And then we'll yeah. go you and then you. I'm just thinking um, in my mind about insurance. Yes. In my mind, my insurance covers certain things. Yes. Medicare covers certain, certain things. things. Yeah. Um, and the way it works is that if I have an issue, and I go see a doctor, mm -hmm. and um, I get an invoice or receipt, or yes. whatever, and I take yeah. it to Medicare, yeah. and they partially cover it. That's right, and then you <coughs> pay the gap. Yeah. yeah. So, with the NDIS, the person then goes to the planner. Yes. Um, they are suge suggested, I mean, they, they come up with a plan. Yes. And they are allocated a certain amount of funding. Yep. Now, um, that's a big bunch of money, say it's $35,000. Yep. Is that for the year? Is that for those things that they've identified that mm -hmm. they want? Mm -hmm. um, do you go back and say, look, this is not working for me, I mm -hmm. need a change? Or mm -hmm. I finished that and yes. I need something else? Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> is that all stuff that still needs to be worked out? Or uh, no, I, I uh, no. Like, <laughs> It's an insurance yes, so model? It's an or insurance or? model, um, uh, that's right, but it's an uncapped scheme. So the question was, um, a person goes along, they get a plan, they get a certain amount of money allocated, is that annually? What happens if they spend it faster than the year? Um, what happens if they need more? Would they be the main points? Yeah. 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 And what happens if they want something and it's much more expensive, I think was the other thing I was reading into there. So let's just look at that. So the plan is constructed on a person's anticipated disability support needs, usually over a 12 month period, usually, but it can be a shorter period than that. And a review date could be built in earlier if that was felt that that was necessary. So normally that money would be for the disability supports required by that person for an annual period. Yep. If the person is self-managing their funding, and at the moment only about 10% of people choose to actually actively manage their funds themselves. Can you imagine the burden? I wouldn't want to do it. Um, but say they were managing their 35000 they don't get $35,000 paid in one go. 
Um, it's worked out between the planner and the person how often they might get paid. Generally, I think it's about monthly, so they'll get an allocation monthly, and that's to pay for their supports for that month. If they don't spend that money, um, that money gets rolled into the next allocation. So if you don't spend it, like you, you, there's no need to save. I mean, this is another yeah. message to get out there. You don't need to hoard your disability support money because you think you might like to do something next month. You need to actually think about what you're going to need month by month. Um, for people who are not self-managing, what happens is the provider invoices the agency directly for the supports that are providing. So they never see the money, they just get the supports, the provider uh, accesses through the provider portal and they get paid within a couple of days of submitting the invoice. But the people can still go into their plan and see what's been provided by whom and you know what the cost was. In terms of the way the pricing structures worked, um, we had people working in every ju jurisdiction to kind of come up with what were the prices being paid locally. So in fact they're slightly different in every jurisdiction. We didn't want to disturb any local markets, but we wanted to make sure that people were paying, being paid properly for the supports that they were receiving, so the plans are calculated on that. And if a person got halfway through the month, say they were self-managing and they'd spent all their money, that would be picked up very quickly and we need to work with them to make sure that you know their plan did fit what they needed, and maybe it did need some no, it does need some adjustment. Um, so in a sense, there's enough flexibility in the scheme to make sure that people's needs are being met. The plans will match their needs. The payments that they're getting should actually match the supports that they're receiving. And somebody is looking at that data all the time. This is who would want to be an actuary, honest to God. But that's what they're looking at all the time to making make sure that plans, supports in there, dollars going out are all lining up. In cases where people want something that say um, I'll use a frivolous example. Say somebody wanted a platinum-plated, turbocharged wheelchair, <laughs> if there, isn't, if there ev even is such a thing. Um, when somebody needs a really expensive piece of equipment or a very unusual support or maybe something that's innovative or new or hasn't been tried before, what's called a benchmark price will go into their plan. So that goes in as a benchmark price and then quotes will be sought. So we're talking about vehicle modifications, home modifications, very expensive pieces of equipment. And, um, and the prices will come back. And say the person want, you know, that comes back, this one's really good, and this is what we'll pay. If the person wants the next one up and they're determined to have that, they can pay the difference. Just as you would, you know, with other things. Yeah. It apply to services as well in terms of co-payments. It it could apply to services. I just don't know of any instances where that has happened, um, but but it, it's possible that that could happen. If somebody really wanted a you know triple A AAA platinum plated service for something, and they could justify that that's what they so needed. If the service provider provides a particular and guarantees a particular service yep. um, that is to that person wants so they guarantee yes. a particular support work yep. or a particular pool of support yes. that that yep. person specifically wants to access, it might cost them more, yes. but they, they feel that that is what is going to make their... And know, they're happy to pay whatever yeah. the, the premium is, yes, that's right. I, I just can't give you a, an example, but I can't see that that wouldn't be something that wouldn't be considered, yeah. yeah. So we're going here, and then here, and then we're here. For, for many reasons, I yes. don't know one. Um, why did you cut off the? Uh, uh, why did you cut off assistance at age sixty-five? I mean, just okay. Uh, yes, I'll talk about that. Yep. Number two, you have. I can think of at least maybe about three people. Yes. Who are in accommodation support? Yes. Already getting quite a bit of. Yes. Funding, yes. Who are already heading into the sixty-five? Very. Yes. Soon. Yes. I think they're also running into dementia because of the condition. Yes. So what happened? Yeah. Thirdly, is it right to say the NDIS agency is actually targeting the newer people who have had no, no. support at all? Yeah. Or are you still looking at those who are having some privileges yes. in the accommodation support? Does it make sense? Yes, it does. So um, the first question was why does it cut off at 65? Yes. So I'll start with that one. Um, that is, that's a policy decision about this scheme really being for people who are not aged 
And so we have an aged care system that kicks in when people turn 65. But the very important thing for you, all of you to know, is if any of your participants under 65 come into the scheme, um, when they get to 65, they can choose to remain in the NDIS, so remain a participant in the scheme, or to transition to the aged care system. So um, once, once you're in there, you know, that choice is there once they turn 65. In a sense, it is about managing those boundaries. You know, we are, again, that's one of those interface issues. So when you're 65, if you need it, you can enter the aged care system. You go into residential aged care if that's what you need. So there's no point having two systems running parallel. But if you've got somebody in the scheme under 65 who's quite well, who doesn't need that, they can, you know, they can choose to remain in the scheme. The second one was about people in residential aged care who are coming up to 65. No, who are in accommodation. Who are in supported accommodation, who are coming up to 65. So uh, again, that is part of that phasing issue. Um, clearly the ACT government is aware that there are some people coming up to 65 for whom it might be ben beneficial to come into the scheme. So I know that that is being thought about and that's probably as much as I can say about that. And the third thing was, no, I can't remember. Uh, is this agency looking at new people, the new mm. faces who have never had yes. any kind of support, support. Which, yeah. are, which are quite plentiful in the ACT, yes. I understand. Yes. Or are they still going to concentrate on people who have got some benefits yes. but need to be more open to community participation and mainstream, yes. Yes. which, is, which we're just yeah. and, and again, I can't answer that at the moment. So I think I talked about the trial site experience so far. So anybody who fell into that category of not receiving any support, they could contact the agency the moment the 1st of July clicked over and they could enter the scheme. Um, but in the ACT, that phasing is still to be determined. But there's another question I can hear in there, which is about uh, the importance of connecting people not just to disability supports but also to those other things. And so you will get a certain proportion of people coming in who certainly have a permanent disability, whose impact of the disability is certainly significant, but who might not need very much. And it might be much more about connecting them in a better, more effective and sustainable way to community and mainstream supports rather than funded supports. Yeah. Yeah. This one? Yeah, I'll just a um, quick question. Does the scheme cover um, illnesses such as cancer, things like that? No. Whether they be short or long term? Yeah, no. So this is that interface issue. So yeah. the, the question was, do the, does NDIS cover cancer and oh, medi illnesses, medi yeah, it, it, illnesses like that? And the answer is no. Right. And the reason is that, again, it's that interface issue with health. So if you have a health condition that's managed largely in the health, health yep. sector, um, even though it can have a disabling effect, it's still really about managing that condition yeah, sure. yeah. in the health sector, yeah, yeah. And look, again, you know, it's not all black and white. You no. know, there may be some instances where yeah. it's a combination of disability and, and a medical condition, yeah. but our planners are, are going to, well, they'll look at all of that. Yeah, sorry, and you have a question. Sorry, I have sort of three, but two of them. Yeah. One was the means testing. It's not means tested. It, 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 so it's not, how much money? Not I means tested. Bank? There's no means tested. No. Um, the other one was the, the mobility allowance. No, mobility allowance was one of those in scope programs. Okay. So one of those programs, it's a federal program, mobility allowance. It was identified as an in scope program, which means that eventually all of that money will roll into the NDIS. For people who are currently receiving it, they'll continue to receive it until the point they transition into the scheme and then it's taken care of in their in their support plan. Yep. Uh, thank that you. The third part, sorry, was, yeah. was the concern that a lot of us have. Yes. Um, we have someone who is actually over 65. Yes. Uh, they've agreed to keep funding him um, as we uh, community access. Right. Um, Program. Yep. But with the NDIS, if he can't access that um, because of his age, we just don't know where to find community access for him. Yep. Aged care, a lot of the programs um, are for elderly people. Yes, or yeah. They all are, of course. But he, his disability can make him quite disruptive. So they really mm. don't want him. They, they have a, just don't worry. Yes. I won't have him in their program. Yeah. So, so, we're in a real loss. so again, I come back to this agreement between all governments about continuity of support. He won't be the only person 
who is currently receiving disability supports who won't be able to access the scheme and governments have agreed that where that's the case they will continue to provide continuity of support for people like that. Mm. Oh, okay. mm. Yeah. Now, who is next? Yes, up the back. Just quickly ask it relates to that one. Um, is there a list of in-scope programs? Yes, there is. Uh, uh, well, there, there was a whole list of all of the in-scope programs for, I don't know, have you published your list? No, no, no. it's just the scheme schedule. Okay. For the ACT? No, the national one. So on the COAG website are all the intergovernmental agreements. So that identification of in-scope programs happened as part of that intergovernmental agreement. So you can find the list there. Yes? Uh, there were some political rappings about Medicare being privatised. Would yeah. that have any impact? No, it shouldn't. Oh, Medibank private. No, that's a different thing altogether. That's a, I mean, people sign up to that privately anyway. It doesn't affect Medicare itself. It's, yeah, no, nothing to do with it. Yeah. I mean, I haven't really looked at it Yeah. No, you can, you can just forget about worrying about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, what about those people who are currently funded now through a block program? So they're yes. Through the block program. Yep. But then when it comes to the NDIS, they may not be eligible to access the NDIS. Mm -hmm. to those Again, coming back to that idea of continuity of support, there will be people that you work with who possibly will not be able to access the scheme. And all governments have agreed where supports are being provided to somebody who's non, not then able to access the scheme, they can continue to access the supports they're receiving now. So does that mean for block funding programs, you know how you were saying that block funding programs are going to be phased? Eventually, or, in the longer term, yeah. Yep. Yep. What happens then? You know what I'm saying? Um, because I there do. are people that won't fit. Yes, there are. And, won't yep. fit, and yep. probably particularly around some mental health stuff as well. Yep. Yep. What happens? Yep. What happens there? Block funding is going to be Yes, eventually. It, it, it is true. So for most um, programs where the, the funding is provided through block grant funding, most of that will be unpicked. Mm. But what we don't know in the ACT is really what the environment's going to look like here in the longer term. Mm. And all jurisdictions have got an eye to the fact that, look, there might be a case in some instances for some programs still to be block funded because each person who's a, who's a participant in that program takes a tiny, tiny slice of it. Mm. It might not make sense to then make that an individual support that's included in their plan. But this is something that you know we'll be looking at very yeah. carefully over the next couple of years, particularly yeah. in the ACT. Yeah. 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 Yes. How will you identify those people? Mm. Uh, well, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, you know, the so people who don't fit, who are currently in block funding, mm. yes. don't fit but would really like to or yeah. need to continue with that? Uh, well, a couple of ways I can think of. So they might, they might come into the shop front, they might do the My Access Checker and find that they're not able to access the scheme, but there is um, an area of concentration which is those people who have disabilities who are not able to access the scheme, in other words, it's not permanent and or it's not significant enough or they don't meet the early intervention requirements and some support can still be provided to those people. Um, it's been called tier two up until now, it's a horrible term, but you know, people with disability who don't make, meet the access requirements. And so just exactly how that will work in the longer term, I don't know. Yeah. Can I just add something there? Mm -hmm. One of the things about the ACT is it's really a very small community. We're talking about 65 or so um, specialist disability services that are currently working with people with disability or psychosocial disability that are likely to be impacted and, and phase into the National Disability Insurance Scheme. You know the people that you're working with, your, um, your managers know the people that your organisation is working with um, better than anybody else. So um, you, you, we're going to know if people are phasing in. We'll, we'll be able to say exactly who will phase in at what point your organisations will know that information. In the next few weeks, you, you'll be able to see exactly who and how and when. And we'll be working with you, with your organisations, to enable that to happen as smoothly as possible. So it is a good thing. We're a small community 
community. If there are five or six people, for example, in a particular program that aren't able, that aren't going to move over, then we need to work with your organisation to ensure that there is that continuity of support. Mm. Yes. Yes. So, yes. So, well, I don't know exactly where the <laughs> money is going to come from. Um, I'm <laughs> going to buy a lotto ticket. No, no um, I don't know exactly because those arrangements are still being worked out. But that is essentially the same question as I've had a few times now about continuity of support. There is no doubt that a proportion of the people you work with will not be able to access the scheme because they won't meet the access requirements. But all governments do recognise this. All of them have said that they uh, have, are absolutely committed to provide continuity of support, whatever that looks like. So those discussions are happening now for the ACT. Yeah. All, all I can, what I can tell you is it hasn't proved to be too much of a problem anywhere else. Yeah. So that to me is a good sign. Yeah. You know, it seems to me we are targeting the people we ought to be targeting. And um, it, it does, just doesn't seem to have been a problem across the existing sites. Yeah. And a second question is, yes. some clients, they receive service from different organisations, yes. like organisation and yep. grounds support. Yes. Um, when they apply for funding uh, for NDIS, yes. um, who, who will help them to... How, how to apply? Like, yes. when they apply separately? No, 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 no. This is one of the big things. Yes. So, yes, in the past it meant you applied here and you got a little bit of this and then you applied here and you got a little bit of this. Yes. No, no more. Yes. You come to the NDIS, your package of supports is constructed. The people who work for the agency will connect you with providers if you've not previously been um, provide, you know, connected with them. Or if you want to stay with the same providers because you're happy with what they're providing and how they're providing it, that is also possible. But it's a single application form, a single plan, a single conduit. Does that mean the client need to apply for funding um, with, with their family's help? Um, uh, they can. They can. So this provider help them, and the, you, the, the planner you mean in the past. Who yes. Is the planner? Who is the planner? Only the, yep. the planner um, with your organisation. Yes. Yes. So with the NDIA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does that mean like um, if as a service provider, if we need to uh, help clients to apply for the yes. Funding, yes. Yeah. Do we need to have a big meeting with all the service <laughs> providers <laughs> to discuss? Um. No. <laughs> um, so uh, essentially it will either be the person themselves who is applying for access to the scheme. Um, families and carers are going to be in there of course for many people and probably a lesser proportion will have no you know, significant person in their lives to help them. In that, in that case it could be a service provider. Um, essentially it's up to the person themselves. So whoever that person wants to help them with the process and to help them with the planning process, it's, it's, um, it's open to them. People have had advocates, you know, formal advocates come with them. They've had a nominee or a guardian, you know, through that process. Um, the, uh, Mm. Yes. 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 Yeah. Technology yeah. system. It's really hard for Yes. Them to indeed. Indeed. And for those, you know, very rare instances where you might have a client who has no other significant person in their life, mm. um, under our legislation, the NDIA can appoint a nominee on their behalf. Yeah. So we also have that as a possibility. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, when when someone goes on and does the check, yeah, the my the access website, checker, that's it. Yep. Does that and and it says whether they are or aren't. Yes. Whether they are, does that trigger the 
department or the sorry, I'm yes. not sure what you're calling it. But does that trigger them to send them a letter, or is it just give them the reference number uh, to come no, in? No, it's a, look, the, it's a bit more complicated. Yeah, yeah, than I'm that. Sure it so is. Um, once we've got the phasing, yeah. once we know what the phasing is, the messages on the My Access Checker will be slightly altered yeah. so that people will get a much better sense of when they're likely to come in. Yeah. For the moment, because we don't have that detail, it mm -hmm. just says contact us after the right. 1st of July. And as I said, it, it generates a, ref a unique yeah. reference number. And once that's entered in after the 1st of July, it pulls up the information that person has provided. That's why it's important to keep it. But look, if you lose it, it doesn't matter. You can but do it again. Post 1 you know. July. Does post it 1 July. Um, yes, it probably will. It might we'll say it contact the 1 800 number to okay. make an appointment, okay. for okay. example, which is what happens in some of the other so trials. So it's still sites. driven by the person that's doing the checking? By the for the moment, yeah. it yeah. is, yes. But remember, I said. Once we know with some reliable certainty who is yeah. coming in in what order, yeah. we will write to them directly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. so they'll have that contact one as well. One year. Yes. One year, one year, one year. Okay. Okay, all right. <laughs> Can I ask about the goals? Yes. Do you have a, a client that comes in to, set, to do their planning? Yes. Who says, my goal is to go on a world cruise? Yeah, great. Which is great. Yeah, great. But they don't acknowledge that they can't get out of bed or mm. they can't um, shower or whatever. Mm. Mm. But they're, they're adamant that's their goal. Right. That sounds what? very tricky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it possibly can happen. Possibly can happen. Because people's yeah. goals are very different to their practicalities. Indeed. Um, yeah. And this is, and this, in a sense, comes back to what I think what I was trying to say before, but probably didn't say very well. Um, the whole issue about goal setting is quite problematic for people with disabilities. So that to me is like a flight of fancy almost, you know, I'd like to go on a world cruise. Um, the steps between where that person is now and getting to that goal are, seem very long, at least to me. Even for me, thinking about going on a world cruise is, you know, a very long distant goal. Um, so doing some pre-planning with families and participants well before they get to the first planning session is our goal so that people understand what a goal is and how it's achievable and understanding the steps and what it is the agency can actually provide to people to help them achieve their goals is going to be very important. I'm just yeah. wondering about the how well the planners actually know, get to know the people. Mm. Are yep. interviews done at home? Yep. They can be, absolutely. So I, I didn't say that before. <laughs> Although we've got shop fronts, our planners spend 70 to 80 percent of their time out of the office. Yeah, that's very different. Yeah. Coming into an office. Very, very different. I agree. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. So most people prefer to have their planning and assessment conversations off site, which is absolutely fine. Some people like to come in because it gives them a break from the rest of their world. But you know, if, if people want to have their um, planning and assessment conversations in a coffee shop or a local library or you know whatever, whatever, it's all fine. Yeah. Mm. Just going on a little bit from that question, yes. my question is around, um, will there be some kind of registration process for service providers yes. to kind of regulate yes. the, the... Yes. Users? So imagine yes. that there could be the potential for there to be some flooding. Mm -hmm. Some snake oil salesmen maybe? Yeah. Mm. yeah. And so how, you know, as particularly yeah. with planners around... Yes. How, how yes. What's, what's so, so yes, uh, providers who want to connect with NDIA participants who are not self-managing. So people who are self-managing can really buy their services from anywhere they choose. But as I said, the majority of people, up to 90%, are choosing to allow the NDIA to manage their resources, which is much less burdensome on them. And that means we have to have a process of registering and being able to say, yes, this is a legitimate provider. So in the other sites, I think the registration process opened in about early May, which was very late, but we're hoping to open it a bit sooner in the ACT. There is a process. Um, for the moment, in each of the jurisdictions, we've accepted the existing quality assurance processes that are in place for those providers. But in the longer term, the agency is going to be working on a nationally consistent um, accreditation and quality assurance process. That is a longer term piece of work. Um, couldn't have that in place for the 1st of July last year, but it's certainly underway now. Um, no, I'm not All right.
This one and then back. No, no, sorry. On. Okay. Peach. 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 <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I forgot what it was. Yes. 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 If, if you, so you're obviously putting your name and everything in there. Only your first name. So it doesn't collect a lot of demographic data. This was the idea, so that we didn't want to have risks with people's personal information. If, if, yep. Oh, okay, because that was going to be my question. If that um, comes up and says, no, you're not eligible, yes. some recourse for appeal and to, to go further. Oh, so, oh certainly. Say, yeah, yeah. Sorry, oh, this is you and you're out. Yeah, yeah, no, oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there, there will be some things that will be very hard and fast. So somebody from Yas, for example, oh, no, no, no. you know, they're not eligible. They have to meet the basic eligible, you know, access requirements. Um, but if it comes up, it, it doesn't usually say, unless it's one of those hard and fast things that you're not in jurisdiction, you're not a person with disability, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It will say it does not appear and then still invite them to contact after the 1st of July. Yeah. Yes. So I wanted to ask around um, the experience that you've had in other places so far around people with very serious mental illness. Yes. And especially maybe if there's a lack of insight yep. and families mm. or services are needed for, for real support. Yes. But the person um, maybe, you know, isn't able to yep. really engage with the process, mm. maybe people who are homeless, for mm. example. What, mm. What's yep. the thing with those that are mm. disabled? I actually don't have anything I can share with you. I think after the last one, this, this also came up. And I said I was going to ask my colleagues in each of the existing trial sites about whether they've got any examples. So I will still do that. I don't have anything specific I can share with you about that. Yeah. The numbers, like to me, 5,000 in the ACT maybe doesn't sound that big. And, yeah. and have, all, you know, have those people kind of been counted in yeah. those numbers? Well, I, I expect so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just, um, so just in terms of looking at what the projected population is for the ACT, um, we look at what who's currently assisted by the the service system, and and there is some about two thousand five hundred people, roughly, there's different figures that are currently accessing formal. Um, support services. So actually getting to 5,000 or 5,075 um, is, is a significant increase in the number of people that would be able to be or el expect to be eligible for services. When we've looked at who's in the service system and who should be eligible, we've looked across the HAC, the Home and Community Care Program, we've looked into the mental health services to look for those people who would indicate to have a psychosocial disability needs related to psychosocial disability or support needs as opposed to those people who are unwell or have um, uh, health needs related to their psychosocial disability and the numbers we've had in the ACT I think is a projection of about 950 people that would be eligible so we've actually got a lot of scope to ensure that everybody who need you know it, it certainly will be more people will be accessing um, services than, than currently so and you had a question yeah I'm just think of it as self-managing yes No. No, they can select outside. And this so is they one. Like it does become bio beware, certainly. And and I mean, this is one of the complicating factors. In an ideal world, everybody would be self-managing and have the most, uh, the broadest flexibility about selecting who provided their services and how. But the reality is, it's only people who are self-managing that will have that high, very high level of flexibility. Um, those who choose to self-manage. The experience has been so far that most of them are people who've got the skills to do that. Um, and many people will select not to do it because, and, and actually even people who've got the skills to do it sometimes don't want to do it, just because of the sheer amount of work involved. But yes, it does become buyer beware. Yep. The and other side of that, if somebody decides to allow the NEIA to manage their, their funds, funds yep. do they then still have the choice of service provider. Absolutely. So if yeah. the service provider is registered with you, yes. there's no constraints put on, because um, in terms of, we, we've always sort of had the exact nominal hourly fee. Yes, so yeah. the agency won't say, no, we are going to choose the most um, economic service fee. Not, not for that. So. I could talk again about the trial site experience. So in order to, I mean, we, it would have been very difficult for the agency at the outset to allow a completely unregulated 
um, provide a market from the beginning. You can understand why that would have been problematic. We would have had no idea about what the costs were going to be. So prices were set for those high volume regular supports that everybody needs, say for example like personal care. They looked at local markets, they chose prices that were operating and existing in local markets and that's the price. Um, I, don't, I don't know whether we're going to do the same thing in the ACT, I'm sorry. We can find that out for you. Um, so people can, any provider who's registered to deliver services in the ACT, if a person's got a package where they see, you know, they need X number of personal support hours a week, they can choose from the personal support providers that are there. Mm. It's only where they're self-managing that they can choose outside because we have to have some way of connecting um, the participant with the providers to allow that invisible back of house payment um, to occur. It was just uh, last year one of the one of the things that stuck in my mind was um, one of the, somebody said that the end disability care, as it was then, uh, would become the largest purchaser of services in, in the country. Yes, that, no. I have to say that. No. No, we don't. We don't so purchase because services. They, there was no. indication given that they would yeah. choose what was reasonable and necessary. Yes. And that if there were two services provided, and at the outset they looked to be about the same, then they would choose. The cheaper one, but that of course reflects that thing of choice. Yes, it does. Yeah. A, a service provider they yeah. want to use. I think that was more um, more to do with those high cost services. So if there were two that were appropriate, yes, we you know when we're talking about the platinum plated turbocharged wheelchair, they'd choose the one that was appropriate and fit for purpose and reasonable and necessary. If the person wanted the next level up, then they could pay the difference. But, yes, yeah. Yeah, co-payments are a possibility, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, and, yeah and, and in kind. So, you know, we talked about how some of the block grant funding cannot be unbundled for the commencement of the scheme here in the ACT. So there will be some providers who continue to be block grant funded as they are in the existing trial sites. And people can still choose to use, they can use that. And if they're already receiving services, they can stay with their provider but they don't get paid for that because they're already being paid. You know, if that person's already a client and they're receiving service, they're still being paid. And so they have to, um, a, an amount of money, which is the in-kind amount that they're contributing to the scheme is, is allocated and set. And then as clients use up that in-kind money, people who are participants in the scheme, and they get to the ceiling, then they can take on new clients and be paid for those additional sessions of service. So that's a sort of a, lay person's guide of how in kind works. Yeah. One more question, I think. Yeah. I, I just want to know, under the NDIS agency, under the scheme, yes. how, how does it affect the support workers like that? We have two categories, the governmental mm -hmm. support workers mm -hmm. and the not agency support workers. Yes. Yeah. Do you have a fixed rate for them or is it actually... Depends on what services are being provided. But they, And again, I just don't know in the ACT whether we're going to fix prices. The, the CEO is wanting to move to an unregulated market. I mean, that is the way you get best competition, absolutely. But unregulated where we don't set prices anymore but at the moment we are setting prices and I don't know whether we're setting prices in the ACT. Um, now this, I'm not going to talk about setting prices but just in terms of employment conditions if you're employed by an organisation now you'd be covered by an award and those award conditions would be re remain in place so most people are employed under an agreement of some form um, and that would stay in place and if you choose to move to a different organisation um, you'd be covered by the awards and conditions of that employment. All right, one last one. All right, two last ones. That's it, that's it. All right, two more. Just, just a really quick okay. One. Our friends that are in, just out of the ACT. Yes. Like yes. Um, is there any idea of when they might be... No. So that discussion with jurisdictions about how and where the rollout will continue beyond the trial period is happening now. But that's going to be very complex. You know, we're going to move from the end of the third year from about 35,000 people into the scheme up to very rapidly around 450,000 people. So I just can't get my head around that. But that discussion is happening now about where and how. Yep. And last one, lucky last. <laughs> Self managing, yep. 
Uh, I got a uh, client's mother. Uh, she told me uh, she would like to purchase the personal care service from a particular nurse. Yes. Um, but the nurse may not register as a service provider. Right. Can can mother do? If she's self-managing, yes, she would be able to purchase that. Can yeah. I do register as a service provider with the IS? Uh, she possibly could register as a provider. I mean, I, 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 sorry. Yes, to, to register as a as a basic level, yes, you would need an ABN to be able to register as a provider, and you'd have to have your own insurance. In, in a sense, you know, it comes to that issue about buyer beware. If you're purchasing services from somebody that has a specialist aspect to it like that, you'd need to be sure that what you're purchasing is what you're going to get. Mm. Yeah. There are, um, on our website already, there are sample agreements for people who are self-managing. So if people are thinking about seeking services from a particular service provider, there's a template um, service agreement that they can use to, you know, formalise whatever the terms of that agreement are. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much for your fantastic attention. <laughs>